All right, let's go. Let's, let's get into the Word this morning. First scripture we're going to go to is Romans chapter 8. We're, we're finishing up our series, You Ask For It. We dealt with issues like end times. We dealt with the gay marriage issue. We dealt with, uh, what else did we talk about? We talked about, what else did we talk about? About fear. So we talked about social things, end times, all kinds of stuff. Today I want to talk about, where do you fit in? What's the, you know, I know we'll talk about this in purpose next week, but what's your identity? What, what's this all about? Some people just feel so lost about things. And they never seem to fit in. They're just like, what, are, what, am, I, what am I doing? I'm going to a crazy church. I, I, I mean, you know, these guys are lifting their hands and going crazy and all this kind of stuff. And, but where, where, where's, where am I at in this thing? What, what do I fit? I've got some interesting thoughts on self-image and different things because you're going to find that the enemy always comes against our self-image to try to get us out of our destiny. Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, we may also be glorified together. So if children, then you get the stuff. If the enemy can get you thinking that you're not a child, he can keep you away from your inheritance. He can keep you away from your peace, your joy, your healing, your prosperity. He can keep you away from stuff. So he constantly, is a, constantly focuses on what we don't. He tries to get us to question who we are, what we're all about. Jesus had the same thing. You know, um, it's interesting that sometimes we think that Jesus kind of walked around with a halo. And, um, you know, as, as a baby, he never, never just, you know, never had a day of crying or anything like that. And he just kind of walked around and, Hoo. But, you know, the Bible says, very interesting, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, let me just read it to you, verse 14, then we'll go back up to Matthew chapter 3. It says, seeing that you have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we obtain, may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. Jesus was tempted in the same way you're tempted. You mean Jesus had the thought of lust after a woman? Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet he didn't give in to that thing. So, in the same way, Jesus walked as man here on earth. Jesus did not walk as God here on earth. He was God, but he didn't walk as God here. He was 100% man, 100% God, but he walked as a prophet under the old covenant anointed under the old covenant. He didn't walk, he didn't have special powers here on earth as God. He walked as a man here on earth because he had to to overcome the enemy's um, things that the enemy would come against him. So let's look at the first temptation of Jesus and then we'll talk about Moses a little bit today. Now in Matthew chapter 3 in the 13th verse, it says, Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me. And Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Then, then he had been baptized. Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove it wasn't a dove, it was descending like a dove. We have the dove signal, but it says he descended like a dove, alighted upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, now notice this, a voice speaks out of heaven. Get this now, this is so important. A voice comes to him and says, this, I'll give you the, I'll give you the God version, the King James, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This voice, I mean, heaven opened up. 
Can you imagine being there that day? I don't know if everybody heard it, but let's say everybody heard it. You're all of a sudden, you're just kind of chilling, and he baptizes them, and all of a sudden, you know, we're here at Faith Center Church, and we're baptized in our portable baptism, and, and all of a sudden, the heavens open, and this voice comes out and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And Jesus, probably it was a confirmation to Jesus, because I believe Jesus had to find himself in the Word. He didn't walk around going, I'm the Son of God, I'm the Son of God. He was, he was found himself, read through the Bible, said, hey, that's me, that's me, that's me. He found himself in the Word. But let's look at the next chapter. This is, that's the last part of chapter 3. And then let's go to chapter 4 and the 14th verse. Or excuse me, uh, excuse me, not, not that. No, chapter 4, verse 1 says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Immediately the devil comes in and tries to get him to convince him that he's not who God says he is. The tempter came immediately, and listen to me, brothers and sisters, it is a pattern for all of our lives. Every time in your life that you step out and try to do something, the enemy is going to try to convince you that you are not what God says you are. That's the whole thing about fitting in. That's the whole thing about self-image. It's the whole thing about the enemy will come in with that voice, and there's voices in our lives that speak to us. That voice speaks to us all the time. There's always that voice. And it usually, it usually winds up with this. Let's put the graphic up on the scene that we have. I am never, you fill in the blank. I am never blank enough. What, what, let's just maybe open it up to you guys. In, in, your, in your life struggle, in your life doing life, and the things that you do in life, and you're trying to accomplish things, and your goals, and your visions, and your dreams, and your families, and all these kind of things, Seems like this comes up a lot. I'm never, what? Good enough, what else? Smart enough, what else? Never spiritual enough. Never strong enough, what else? Never skinny enough. Oh, that's, that's we laugh, everybody laughing because that hit the nerve with half the church. <laughs> Let's get something from over here from the wisdom side. What's that? Not fast enough? Focused, Focused enough. Now nah, these guys were smarter over here. Let me go back over here. <laughs> Give me something else over here. What else? Rich. Never rich enough. What else? Bold. Never bold enough. Pretty. Pretty enough. That was a guy who said that. <laughs> I'm not sure I get that. I'm definitely not pretty. <laughs> but you're right. Okay, let's get, what else? I'm not loved enough, or love, uh, confident, generous, faithful, passionate. You, you can see this goes on and on and on in our lives. And it's always the question in our lives. And the enemy will always try to rob you, just like he tried to do Jesus. He tried to rob him. If you're the son of God, this is my beloved son in whom I well please. Well, if you're the son of God. Turn these stones into bread. If you were really a Christian, you wouldn't have watched that movie like you watched that movie. If you're really a Christian, you wouldn't have got angry the way you got angry. If God was really on your side, you wouldn't be going through the struggles that you're going through right now. If God was real, how come that person died? Are you getting anything I'm saying today? It's a constant battle that we deal with that question right there. And we must answer that question every day of our lives. So I want to take you over and look at a guy by the name of Moses. One of our heroes in the faith. We've, you know, you've seen the Ten Commandments, right? If you, I guess you've got to be over 40 to understand that. But... The Ten Commandments comes out, and I've got these little things, uh, insecurities. I'm not smart enough, experienced enough, good enough, patient enough, consistent enough, strong enough, rich enough, organized enough, so on and so forth. So we get the story of Moses. Now Moses is going out, and 
Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 1. Moses goes into, now you know the story if you've ever watched the Ten Commandments and those kind of things, and you've read, read your Bible, you'll know that they're going to kill all the Hebrew children a certain age, and, and Miriam, Moses' um, mother, takes him down, puts him in a basket, floats down. Pharaoh's daughter finds him. She raises him as... She raises him as his own, and they, it's kind of funny how they come around and they say, well, you need a nursemaid for, for this child. So they go get Moses' mother, and she gets to basically raise the kid anyway. So he's raised as a, a palace guy. I mean, this guy is not raised as a Hebrew slave. He's raised as an amazing guy. But he gets so tired of the oppression of the people of, of you know, because he knows he's a Hebrew, and he gets so tired of the oppression of Pharaoh on the people. This one guy was whacking on somebody, so he goes up, and I don't know what he does, but, you know, he gives him a karate chop, and he kills this guy. And he kills one of the Egyptian guys, and then he flees this whole thing, and he takes off, and he goes from the palace to the backside of the desert, and he's raising sheep for his father, father-in-law, Jethro. He marries this gal, and he just decides, I'm out of this thing, I'm out of the loop. Now Moses, we figure, is probably around 80 years old, somewhere right around 80 years old at this time that this burning bush thing's happening. So he wasn't a young man, and so really, you have no excuse if you're older, you, you're not done with life. So Moses is like 80 years old. He's just minding his own business. He's got the sheep business going on. He's got his new Chevy pickup. He's hanging out. He's got it jacked up. He's got the winch on the front. He's hunting on the weekends. You know, he's fishing. He's hanging out. He's playing golf. He's a three handicap. Everything is right in his life. But now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of the Midian, and he led the, uh, led the flock back to the back of the desert uh, and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great thing, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, do not, draw, or do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good land, large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, and to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and all the mites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me, then say to me, What is your name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, for I am has sent you. Three observations quickly. Number one, first thing Moses did is he asked this question. And this is the first thing you and I, when God, about the things of God, our assignment, things that God gives us. First thing we ask is, who am I? Which deals with our past. Moses was asking the question, hey, you, you don't understand. You called the wrong guy because... You, I killed somebody. I, I kill, I'm, I'm wanted for murder. I, I'm wanted for murder in, in Egypt. I'm wanted for murder. And who am I to go there? And many of you ask that question because of your failures in life. You failed. You've gone through, who am I, Lord? I went through a divorce. Who am I, Lord? I've been through addiction. I've been, I've been addicted. Who, who am I, Lord? I, 
I, I, I messed up, I, did, I lusted, and I did something stupid, and I did that. Who am I, Lord? I, 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 I drink too much. Who am I, Lord? I, I, we start dealing with our, our past, our, our situations that we're not sure about. What? And we start asking the question. And, and, and I think that's so true of all of us as we start asking that and constantly dealing with that question of who am I? That voice that speaks to us, that, 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 that thing that says, wow, you messed up. And that's the voice of the enemy that will constantly be on you and will rob you of your destiny because they'll get you to convince you that you're not worthy of the position that God has for you. And if you're not worthy of that position, then you're not worthy of the inheritance that God has for you also. So he tries to bring us down in the past. The divorce haunts us and the lust haunts us and the past haunts us and all those kind of things. But God's answered that question already. The second thing he deals with is the second thing you de- Moses dealt with is the second thing you and I deal with. The first thing is he starts dealing with about our past. Well, you don't understand. I've been through this. I've been this. I've been this. The second thing Moses says is in chapter 14, verse 10. He says, then Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent. Some people say he was a stutterer. He stuttered terrible. Neither before, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen, or the blind? Or have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I'll be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. But he said, O Lord, please send by the hand whomever else you may send. In other words, Lord, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this, Lord, because it's hard. He said, I don't want to do this. Send somebody else. Now notice this. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, it's not Aaron. He goes on and talks about this. Now, something I want to point out. I'm going to point out some very interesting things to you in the next few minutes. First one is this. You think that your humility pleases God, but it's a false humility because God got mad at Moses for saying, I'm not worthy of this. So a lot of times we think that us, that's, we're being humble because we say, oh, I'm not worthy to do that, or I, 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 you don't understand this. And the Lord, the Lord, the Lord says he's, his anger was kindled against Moses' response. So when you get out there and say, I just can't do this. I'm just no good. I'm deficient. I can't speak. I can't do that. I can't do this. I can't do this. What you're saying is, God, you're not big enough to work through me. Because Moses didn't doubt God. He doubted God's ability in him to work. Or he doubted himself and God to work through him. He wasn't doubting whether God could do it. He was just doubting whether God could use him. And a lot of times in our life, we're not doubting God. We know he's all powerful, but we doubt whether we can do it with God. So the first one he deals with, and I'm almost done. First one he deals with is he deals with our past. The second thing he deals with is he deals with our deficiencies. I can't believe the Lord called me to preach publicly. I mean, I'm talking about me. I can't believe it because I would flunk a, I would rather flunk a class in high school rather than give an oral speech. And I mean, when I, when I went to Bible school and said this, I said, well, you know, I'll do this, Lord, but can we avoid the public speaking part of this thing? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> I, I tell you what, I, 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 you're looking at a guy up here that, I, I fulfill the scripture of God that says God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. <laughs> People from my high school look at me and say, what? One girl said to me at my 20-year reunion, she said, I just got to know what happened to you. I heard you got hit in the head in a car accident. (laughs) I said, no, I didn't get hit in a car accident. I just fell in love with Jesus. Once you tell him you fell in love with Jesus, he was like this. I just want to know what happened to you. Well, I just just fell in love with Jesus. (laughs) See you later. I got to get a drink. (laughs) See you later. So the Lord deals with, number one, our past. I, I'm, not, I'm not good enough. Number two, he deals with our deficiencies. Yeah, but you don't understand. You call me that, and I got mad at my neighbor last night. I got mad on the freeway. I, I cussed somebody out. Well, welcome to Peter. 
I think it was Ken said Friday night at the service, he said, if there was an F word back in Peter's day, Peter would have used it. <laughs> Peter was that kind of guy. And he became one of the great apostles. God's not interested in your nows. He's interested in your tomorrows. Your nows, he'll say, I'll take you any way I can get you. I'll take you all your sand, all your junk, all your junk in the trunk, everything. I'll take you because I, I'm going to clean you up. Amen. Now, the third thing is amazing. He says this. He says, I am who I am. Moses said to God, verse 13, chapter 3, verse 13. Moses said to God, indeed, I've come to the children of Israel and say to them, God of your fathers has sent you. And they say to me, well, what's your name? And he said, I am who I am. And I can just see Moses going, uh, is there a, can, can we go with something else? I am who I am. Can we go with something else? I mean, I am who I am. What, what's up with that? I mean, is your name John? You know, I'm, God, I'm the God all my, no, I, I am who I am. Let me tell you why he said that. Let me tell you why he said, I am who I am, because he put the graphic back up, put the graphic back up, if you would. He is the fulfillment of that blank right there. He's the present tense fulfillment of that blank. He'll fill in the blank in the sense of a good sense is, I am never, or I'm always, boom, enough. I'm always, because I am that I am will overcome your stuttering problem. I am that I am will overcome your past problem. I am that I am will overcome your not rich enough problem. You're not organized enough problem. You're not, you're not this problem or that problem. I am who I am will take care of every situation that you have. Last thing I want to share with you is just, just a, a submission of something, a thought that um, I, I heard this from, um, uh, what's his name, the message that... Uh, Stephen Furtick, and he said this is just such a brilliant point. In the Ten Commandments, one of the Ten Commandments, I mean the Ten Commandments, they're big deals, you know. I mean, they were set up for the children of Israel to, to look at them and see them how that they were, you know, how this is the, where, this is the standard in which we're going to live our lives. And in, in Deuteronomy 5.11, he says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him harmless who takes his name in vain. Now, we, I always looked at this up until just a couple days ago. I always thought it was this. You not take the name of the Lord in vain. So I thought, if you drop a Jesus Christ, you're taking the Lord's name in vain. Or if you drop a God, whatever, then you're taking the name's Lord. And, and I thought that was the huge part of the commandment. But let me give you a, di a different thought on this verse. Now, remember, I am who I am. When... Theresa and I got married in 1982. She, we changed her name from Wright, because she thought she always was, <laughs> to I am. <laughs> but we changed her name, and she went down, we filled out social security numbers and cards and did through all the process, and, and she changed her name. And she took my name and she be, went from Wright to Johnson. She took my name as a covenant relationship. She took on my name. And I'm here to tell you, my wife did not take my name in vain. She took on my name, and she honors that name. And she, as a, a, a standard bearer of my name, probably better than I am. So maybe you should not take the name of the Lord in vain, is saying to God, I can't do this. I will never accomplish this. And he's saying, hey, wait a minute. I am has sent me. You're taking my name in vain, and it's an insult to me. Because I gave you an assignment. I gave you a plan. I gave you a purpose. And I said, I'd be right there. I am that I am to help you fulfill that. And when you say I can't, you're taking my name in vain. You ever thought about that? I don't think there should be one excuse left in this building today. Not one excuse. 
Are you going to take the Lord's name in vain when he calls you to do something? When he tells you that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? When he says you're a head and not the tail, you're above only and not beneath? And you start downgrading yourself and thinking it's humility. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses because Moses said, I couldn't do this. Would you call somebody else? And the Lord said, shut up, shut up. Get up there. Do your job. I called you. You can do it. And then Moses became the superhero, man. This guy was parting Red Seas and, and striking rocks and having water come out of it and speaking to rocks and water coming out of it and saying, go over there and, you know, the man will fall out of heaven. The dude was amazing. Why? Because he didn't take the Lord's name in vain eventually. What are you taking the Lord's name in vain in? For us to say, I can't is to take the Lord's name in vain. That's got to, that's, that makes more sense than cussing, doesn't it? I mean, doesn't that make more sense? Thou shalt not cuss. One of the Ten Commandments? I think he's talking about taking on the name of the Lord and then not acting the way the Lord wants us to as a champion for God. What is it in your life? What is it in your life that has been, that you've said, I won't do, I can't do, I, I just can't do it. I've got this, I've got fear, I've got depression, I've got, I, I've got anxiety, I, you know, I've got phobias, I've got all this kind of stuff. One of, my, one of my biggest things in life for me is, I, I, you know, this bathroom thing to me is just something I, I like good Nice, clean bathrooms. And the Lord called me to go to the Philippines. They do not exist there. Well, they do exist at Jane and Annalise's place. But that's about it. Most of the places I go, they're the worst. And I got this. And, and it's like, I, th I can just see the Lord going. <laughs> <laughs> and what we think is such a big deal, the Lord would say, well, you just trust me. We just trust me? I don't know. There's probably too many people to pray for individually. So, But is there areas where you've taken the Lord's name in vain? Can I pray for you right now? Probably too many people to mention, but is there areas? I'm sure we all have them. Maybe I should just have everybody stand up. But Just everybody. If you've taken the Lord's name in vain, and you know it. Come on, let's just stand up. His love is so deep, it washes over me. Never again do I want to hear out of this church, well, I can't do that. You know what humility is? Humility is not sitting back going, oh, I just don't want very much, Lord. Just give me a cabin by the river. I just want enough for me and my family, us four, no more. Well, you selfish little dog, you. You ought to be saying, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get this world's goods. And then I'm going to deliver it to somebody that's going to win people to Jesus. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to rise up like never before. I'm going to give to missions. I'm going to give to, I'm going to go out. I'm going to build the biggest business I have. I'm going to give 50% of all my profits away. We have a hundred, whatever. I don't know. You think the Lord would bless me in that? Don't take the Lord's name in vain. The Lord has amazing things for all of you. Every single person to the sound of my voice, whether you're here for the first time or the thousandth time, God has amazing things for you. I want to end the service today and not have you come forward or anything because it's just too vast. Of, I just sense it's just everybody, including myself. <laughs> I just want to pray for you. You receive it today. You receive from the Lord. You receive what the Lord has for you today. And then you make that dedication. Okay, Lord, I've been taking your name in vain in that area. I'm not going to do it anymore. Because I am that I am going to fill in my blank. And I'm going to get rid of those negative thoughts. I'm going to get rid of those other things. I'm not going to feel unworthy anymore. I'm not going to feel depressed anymore. I just refuse. To, I refuse to just allow this stuff to come on me anymore. Receive this right now. Receive this prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus pray right now for every person in our congregation 
that they'd no longer take the Lord's name in vain. I am who I am. He's our present help in time of need. And Father, He wants to be that to us. He loves us so much. He wants to be that to us. He wants us to be the parters of the Red Sea. He wants us to be the business owner. He wants us to be the great mothers and fathers and champions and and, and youth workers and, and recovery workers and, and financial people and business owners and whatever, God. I just thank you, Father God. We'll never question you and doubt you again. Oh, it'll come. It'll try to come on us. But we refuse to doubt. We refuse to take that doubt any longer because I am who I am is now part of my life. Father, I just pray for every single person. First off, Father, we just repent for our sin of questioning you questioning your goodness, questioning whether you could really perform this. We, we ask you to forgive us, Lord. And now, Father, we ask you to forgive us for our past and then forgive us for trying to use our deficiencies as an excuse. And now we take you as God and Father and say, Father, whatever you have for us, whatever you have us do, we take that on. In Jesus' name we pray. And if you agree that, would you say...